Is it recording? It is recording, Brian. All right. Here we are on the Blind Man in Black. I am your host, Brian Snyder. And once again, uh, I am here with deprofessionalized intellectual, author, activist, dear friend, and mentor, Gustavo Esteva. Thank you so much for being here again. It's, it's an honor to have you. And I know you don't like me say, saying honor, but uh, it just came out and I couldn't help it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you, how are you holding together right now? How are you feeling? I am feeling pretty well. Many things, many beautiful things are happening in my context, in my place, in spite of the world falling apart. Can you, can you kind of talk about some of those beautiful things? For example, it's, uh, the, the thousands of communities, not just a few, not two or three, but thousands of uh, communities, indigenous communities, that are, have been reacting in a magnificent way uh, to the predicament. That is a very complex predicament. It's not just COVID. It is many things happening against them. And they are reacting in a beautiful way. And they, they have been regenerating their own traditions and, and uh, doing the right things and with the impressive results. Um, you, you, you have, uh, first about the COVID, you have uh, thousands of communities with no COVID cases and other thousands of communities in which uh, the figures about deaths, etc., are clearly below all the national or global average. And the good thing, it's not only this thing about COVID, the, the attention, the focus is not no longer COVID. The attention is how uh, to have a good life, how to live well, how to live well in these conditions and to reclaim a way of life uh, that was being forgotten for following alternative paths. This is beautiful. This is really uh, and for, for us, it's really a motive. The second point, or perhaps the first point, is uh, the current position and participation and role of women. Uh, women are really taking the lead. Um, women are very active. I think that it is serious what they did a year ago, in the March 8th, a year ago, when they broke the patriarchal normalcy. And now you can see it is, it is really beautiful, Brian, uh, to see even in a normal conversation in any one of our study groups or, or the normal conversations that one of the girls tells the guy, hola compa, you cannot do that anymore. <laughs> you cannot talk like that to us. Just, just the normal expression, what was normal, Brian? What was the normal way of men talking to women? And what is fantastic, Brian? I really enjoyed it the other day when I saw they are correcting the gaze and telling a guy, no, Pedrito, you cannot see us that way any longer. Mm. That is not correct. And, and that was normal, Brian. That was the usual thing that men were seeing the women in a certain way and were talking to women in a certain way. And now they are no longer uh, accepting that. that is now, when you say that, are you talking about um, objectification and exploitation yes. and just kind of belittling and so on? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, uh, and, 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 and the way... And, and there, there has been, and, uh, and uh, I think we did not notice enough uh, that there was for thousands of years, a position of superiority of men in their relation with women. Um, seeing them always from the, the position of a higher status. And, uh, and uh, that was normal. We, we did not see any longer because it was normal. There was the way thing, things were. And this is what the women are saying, no longer, basta, enough. We, can, we are no longer accepting that situation. And wow. That, that is really beautiful. It's, it's really beautiful to see, to enjoy it. And of course, in Unitierra, 
this has been a very radical change. And the women are really leading UNITIERRA, are now in all the positions of decision and, and, and leading, leading in a very beautiful way uh, all the activities in UNITIERRA. Now, for those listening and watching, UNITIERRA is uh, short for Universidad de la Tierra, which is an autonomous uh, learning center, which you co-founded, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that for those that weren't familiar with Una Tierra. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's, an, and it's a, an amazing place. I spent uh, a lot of time there and it's, um, you know, people working together to find uh, autonomous means of learning and living. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful community of, of people uh, uh, trying to do what the Zapatistas called create a world where many worlds are embraced. And it's, uh, and it's wonderful, and um, I, I'm I was uh, delighted to be able to be there and, and experience that. But um, in moving forward, let's talk. We are, are the focus for today. We're going to talk about, and we kind of address it in, a little bit in the previous uh, episodes, and I think we've done five now together. Uh, so this will be number six, and uh, today's focus is we're going to talk about how to remove the fascist from within. Now, I also wanna add something in addition to that, because I think there's a deeper root underneath what that is, the why we uh, assimilate that fascist thinking um, is it, it's, it's a very destructive um, kind of way of thinking. And I think it, it, that's kind of the heart of it is as human beings, what leads us down this path of becoming destructive rather than becoming creative and loving. And uh, there's kind of this, I, I think I think a lot of it comes from, you know, trauma and pain and wanting to externalize that on others, to see it in others, to, to have uh, some type of solidarity. I think serial killers do that. They want to inflict the pain that they've experienced on others. And it's, and it's a pathological, um, you know, kind of way of thinking. So let's let's kind of get into that if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the most important things um, is um, the, the for for many years, for more than 40 years, I have been obsessed with that uh, phrase of Foucault uh, when he said he talked about the fascists that we all carry inside that forces us to love the power that oppresses us. Uh, that, that is something that I could not process well, I could not understand well, and for many, many years I discussed this with friends, I tried to explore it. Part of it because I think is because we assume uh, in the normal conversation, the normal perception, that uh, power is a kind of thing uh, that some people have and some other uh, don't have. And then we talk about the powerful, those with power, that thing, the power, and those without power. And for example, the World Bank has many programs to empower those without power, the women, the indigenous people. And then we assume that it is a question of redistribution of power, the redistribution of that specific thing that power is. But Foucault explains that, but it is not so easy to, to read this in Foucault, uh, that power is not a thing, someone, something that some people have, but uh, power is basically a relation. And in that relation, there is one of the parties that surrender his, her will to the other party, and that is power. And that means that in uh, all the time in the power system, in the power relation, in the power operation, we are in one side, but we have in our hands the power to change that relation. And then this is something that we don't do. And then the question is to explore how, how we come to love 
the power that oppresses us. First, I, I would mention there are situations in which we are forced to surrender our will because there are the immediate physical coercion. For example, in a prison. In a prison, the prisoner is surrender his, uh, the, his will to the people in the jail because they can apply immediate physical coercion on that person. Then in that case, you don't love that power. Uh, you accept the power, you surrender your will because you don't have any option. And this happens also to us in, in every day. For example, when we surrender um, our will to the tax authorities and we pay the taxes, it is, it is a situation of power. We cannot say just, no, we are not, I am not paying the taxes because we immediately have problems. Uh, but in that case, uh, the practice of power um, does not produce love, but most of the time hate. You, you hate that specific oppression. You don't like that oppression. Then we are talking about the situation when we talk about the fascists that we have inside, is the fascist that forces us to love the power that oppresses us. And then we can see that um, that situation uh, can be because we love someone, a charismatic leader, we adore him, we adore what he is doing, and no matter if he is oppressing us because we love him, we love this charismatic person or charismatic group, or we have political, religious, uh, ideological motives to accept, to adore, to love that power that oppresses us. I would say immediately, uh, Brian, that we have been educated that way. That is education. I, I, I cannot uh, conceive a more despotic uh, system than the classroom. In the classroom, you have one person that has all the power. He is always right. He has the reason, and he is doing everything for the good, to do some good to the children. Well, if you see what happens in the classroom, most of the time, is that perhaps and the childhood is ruined because you cannot play, you cannot do, you do your things, you cannot behave as a child, but you need to behave according to certain rules. You need to accept arbitrary instructions. Uh, you need to craft, sacrifice a lot of things. And the point is, Brian, that many children, many, many children love their teachers. They are oppressed by the teacher. They are suffering the consequences of having the teacher and doing the homework and doing all these kind of things. And they adore the teacher. And, and that is the system inside us that format, create the, the format uh, uh, of our behavior uh, to love the power that oppresses us. Later, we can have the same in the work, the same in our political activities, the same everywhere, but we are already formatted, scheduled to love that power that oppresses us and assume that it is for our own good. And it, it seems like capitalism itself really is designed in that way, and I, I, mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm quoting somebody here, and I'm not sure who, who maybe Frederick Douglass, but um, it, it's, it's designed in a way that we love our chains. We love, we love our, our, our shackles. It is very, very clear. Uh, I have used it many times uh, the recent example of three million workers in Spain uh, marching in the streets. 
and the main message was um, uh, there is something worse than being exploited by capital, and that is not being exploited by capital. <laughs> 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 I want my my jobs back. Mm -hmm. uh, please give me again my employment. The employments are terrible. Employ the terrible jobs doing. Uh, even the life from their capitalism, the, the very idea, wh what you are suffering, Brian, it's eight hours a day of a job that you don't like with the, with the conditions that uh, are not, are very oppressive for the people. And the people finally love those kind of change. And they cannot conceive the life without those kind of change, without that kind of oppression. Yes, that system, is is uh, designed in that specific way I don't but I, I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned education because that's a part of it too i mean i think every aspect to it of of uh, our culture especially in the united states is designed so that we love being oppressed we love the uh it could be entertainment it could be um uh education it could be um anything really um, it's every aspect is designed, and I, I know that it's overused, but the idea of the matrix, the film, you know, uh, the idea of, uh, that we're kind of being farmed and, uh, and, and exploited in that way. I mean, I mean, I think it's a, that, that one of the reasons why that movie is so popular is because it is saying what is, is happening to some degree, even, even though it's dramatized, um, and, and the other thing I want to go back to is the, you mentioned the prison. And one of the things you sent me years ago, which I, I, I love, is it was John Berger's, um, it, I can't remember the name of it. It's like Global Prisoners. It, it's from uh, Guernica. Yes, yes, it is. It is, um, it, it is a very a great, fantastic expression of, of, uh, of Berger uh, saying, it is uh, describing basically that if we had only one word to describe the current condition of the world, uh, the word that we will be forced to use is a prison. Yes, we are living like prisoners. You we know, forced. Oh, oh, please continue. We are forced to obey the instructions we receive every minute of the day. And I, it reminds me when I was in uh, undergrad at Cal Arts, I, I had a, a, a dramaturgy professor that uh, we were we were studying. Um, it was uh, Otto Fugard's The Island. It's about two prisoners in South Africa. And one of them uh, is able, you know, learns that he's able to leave the prison, but the other one has to stay there for life. And, and as a supplemental kind of piece to dis, to kind of frame the discussion, the uh, professor, um, it was like a conversation between Pascal and Camus. And it basically, they created this metaphor for our existence is that life is a prison. And at the beginning of each day, someone is brought in. And at the end of the day, somebody is taken out and executed. The question is, what do we do in those 24 hours between the new prisoner being brought in and somebody being taken out and executed? Do we cry? Or do we turn to the person next to us and say, my name is Brian? And, uh, and the question is, uh, the very fundamental question is, um, uh, can we change that relation? We are doomed for the rest of our lives to live in that prison. Yes, the world is constructed that way, uh, but uh, we are precisely in the moment in which that, that world, that prison is falling apart. And then this is exactly the time in which we can try to do something else. When we can try to, to it is not, the world is not to escape from that prison. Uh, but it is to abandon the condition that forces us to stay in that prison. Um, 
there are, this is, this is uh, trying to redefine our life and to see how our life is trapped in that specific uh, system. Um, how, as Ivan Illich said, how we became subsystems of systems. We are forced to behave, to obey the rules of a system because we have become subsystems of that system. This is happening all the time when we're using the tools that are no longer tools, but systems, because their tools are not at our service. They don't do what we want them to do, but we are forced to do what those tools, those systems imposes, uh, impose on us. Uh, that is the question. And then the, the question is that apparently most people, and it is not so difficult, can start the li living their own life, not the life imposed on them. And there is one way in which you can uh, see immediately. Um, it is not so easy, but it is, you, you can see immediately the problem. If we are prisoners of consumption and we cannot survive without consuming, then that is a very clear definition of the prison. First, we need the money to buy the things that we uh, need to survive. And second, we need to be able to have access to the market where they have the products that we need to consume to survive. And then uh, we can, this is one aspect very clear, very obvious of the prison. We are prisoners of consumption. And then the question is as simple as that. We need to escape from that prison. We need to escape from the prison of consumption. We need to abandon the principle of consumption that you cannot live without consumption. And the, econo and the economic elite, I mean, one of the things they're brilliant at is marketing the illusion of freedom within consumption that you are free when you consume. If you buy an RV and travel throughout the United States, you are free, you know? Yeah. And that you have the freedom of choice, that you can choose whatever product offered by the market, that you are not forced to buy one specific brand or one specific product, but you have, you have the freedom to choose whatever you want. That is another way they sell to you that you are free, that you are not prisoner of consumption. And it's so it's so fucking funny because like like the the it, it, it the 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 illusion is really falling apart because uh, it, 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 the greed the the immense greed has become so uh, uh, rampant that they want everything and the quality of everything is is falling apart. You buy something and it, you know I mean there's part of it is built in obsolescence, but the other part of it is just that they want to keep production costs low and, and 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 in doing that it just makes everything just shitty and 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 i think that's what's really happening is it's really falling apart every you, you buy something and it's just it's just a piece of shit with the uh, even when it's brand new for any person of my age i am as you know 84 years old but for all the people of my uh, age that is the daily experience that we can no longer get the products that we used to get 50, 60, 70 years ago. There, and there was a, there was a, a funny, I, I remember this very clearly. There's, I don't know if you remember the, the television show All in the Family. It was actually a brilliant show. It was a commentary on, um, you know, capitalism and, um, and all of the social injustices. And one of the things that came up was there's, there's a scene in this episode where Archie, uh, is there's something wrong with the refrigerator? And he's talking to uh, Rob Reiner's character, Meathead, and he's like saying, and Meathead's trying to fix it. And Archie said, Don, leave that alone. This, this refrigerator is only 20 years old. <laughs> and, and like, you know, the, I, I was shocked at the time because I'm like, nothing lasts that long anymore. 
Yeah. And, 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 and at that moment, he's expecting it to last even, you know, 10 more years or whatever. And, and so that built in obsolescence or planned obsolescence is so, uh, is out of control now, you know, um, it, nothing lasts. And, and it's just, it's just to some degree, it seems like we just don't give a shit about it anymore. That you replace it and that's it. You buy yeah. the next one. That is, the, that's, uh, and, and then um, the question is then uh, we need to explore and we need to really have a reflection of about the construction of needs. What is what we really need? Uh, because we are assuming that we need a lot of things that we have been educated to need. It is not that we really need that, but it is really that we have been programmed to, uh, ha to feel the need of that kind of things. And perhaps the most obvious things and something that is very difficult to even to talk with, uh, with the people is uh, the need of education and the need of health. Uh, let's start with, with health. Uh, this is a very peculiar word that uh, it is very, it, um, it can be, uh, Illich did the, the study how the idea of uh, health was constructed. And uh, we can see how pathological is the idea of the pursuit of health, something that you will never achieve, that will spend your whole life trying to get health that will vanish from your hands because you cannot get that specific kind of thing, that unexistent thing that is health. Now, can I can I clarify that? Because it reminds me of in Buddhism, there's the four sufferings, uh, birth, sickness, old age and death. So is it the idea is it essentially what you're saying is there is no way to escape sickness? It is not it is not to play with sickness and, and, and health. Um, it is um, it, it's again construction. What is sickness? Uh, you, you have uh, the medical profession inventing uh, diseases almost every day, creating diseases that will create the medicine, that will create the treatment, create the drugs to deal with uh, diseases that have been invented, that, that have never existed and did not exist, do, do, does not exist, do, don't, don't exist today. Uh, we, we can abandon this very specific uh, idea. Uh, of uh, health and sickness, um, we can we can say what is to feel well. Uh, what you are feeling well, or you are not feeling well, and reducing our beings to pieces to organs. Uh, when we are talking, and now my kidney is uh, failing me. What is this? Who is talking? Uh, who is the owner of my kidney? Uh, how, how I can talk that, that 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 way? How we can I can decompose myself in a collection of organs, physical and mental organs, and some of them may be sick. Uh, I think in the traditional communities, uh, in uh, traditions that are still alive and have been very very effective in the last year. This is, you, you cannot conceive things like that. You cannot say, you cannot talk that way. You cannot express yourself uh, in, in, in that way. You are feeling well or you are not feeling well. And um, usually what you have is a problem in your relation. And that is why usually you cannot see in the communities that they conceive any kind of disease as an individual problem. It's a communal problem. It's a question of the relations, of the equilibrium in the community. It is something that the community should take care of. And this is exactly what they have been doing in this, in this time. Uh, assuming full responsibility and, 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 and the kind of things, trusting yourself, trusting your own capacity, trusting your body, and, and assuming the gifts of nature and the gifts of of, of being alive and celebrating being alive and, and, and adopting a completely different attitude 
about what is to be healthy, what is to heal, um, what is uh, to to live a healthy life instead of a life that is producing you all kind of diseases. Um, just just to give an example, um, it, it is now um, commonplace. Uh, what uh, was in Galeano 20 years ago, the, the Uruguayan poet, when he produced a fantastic uh, poem in which he wrote, in these times of global fear, those, those that are not afraid of hunger are afraid of eating. And we, we know that very well. I, I think there is no person that ignores the fact that the food sold in the market is toxic, that they are intoxicating us with that kind of food. And that if we see all these very popular uh, soups uh, sold by the millions in the market and many poor people buying that uh, very simple soup. Yeah, uh, about like canned soup. Yes, and, and uh, soup um, maruchan is uh, called here. Uh, it's a brand of the of the of the soup. Uh, there are now public information about how any of those soups have between thirty and eighty chemicals. Some of them for the addiction to produce addiction, mm -hmm. like uh, all the the, the um, refreshments, uh, just like Coca Cola, Pepsi Cola, etc. All, all those products uh, have elements to create the addiction, to create in your own being, your body, one element that produce the need, the anxiety to get that kind of thing that you are missing. They create the need artificially, chemically. And many of these chemicals, chemi chem chemicals are really damaging. I will tell you this, um, a, a few years ago, uh, I went out with some friends to lunch and uh, they wanted to go to Red Lobster. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I mean, I, I, it's not, I, I usually don't eat at fast food places or chains like that. And I remember after, I remember eating this food and I was like, I, I felt unsatisfied. It was so salty, I had to keep ordering drinks to like, because I felt like I was my, I was, you know, I needed more water. Um, and it was just, it, it was just, it felt like I was, was not full. Like I always needed more. That's it. That is. Exactly. It's like, it's, it's addictive as crack. That is, that is. Yeah. Uh, even more, <laughs> <laughs> even more because you cannot stop. Uh, and the, the question is uh, then that, um, uh, the only way to survive for us and for the planet is to stop. It's the only way we need to stop. It's not possible to survive if we don't stop. Uh, this is what we need to do. The good thing is that uh, now, today, millions of people are doing exactly that. And. Uh, one way of expressing this that looks very abstract is to say that millions of people are reclaiming, recovering the principle of sufficiency, meaning what is enough, instead of the principle of always more. We, we need more of everything. We want more of everything. We want more salary and a better salary, better income to buy more and more things. And we always, even if we have 10, then we want 20. And if we have 20, we want 40. And we always want more and more of everything. And people are discovering, rediscovering uh, that that is foolish. That is path for unhappiness, path to suffering but to destruction, destruction of ourselves and destructions of the destruction of the planet. Brian, we have this, been discussing for years, you and me, uh, the question of uh, the, the planet, the destruction of the planet, how we're destroying Mother Earth, 
uh, you remember that we discussed a few years ago the um, prediction of one guy saying that uh, last year was the last year. Uh, that the planet we yes have. guy mcpherson yeah he said well he said that um and i and i'm probably misquoting him to some degree because i i don't understand these all of the science but basically he was saying that within five years due to climate change that um all life on earth would end and the reason being is his theory was is that there's something uh, there's not only you have the carbon in the atmosphere, which is building up, I think it's over 400 parts per million. And then the idea is that if you decrease it, there's something called global masking or something like there's particles in the, in the atmosphere that are, that are just sitting there. Uh, I think they're from coal or something like that. And if, and if you stop reduce carbon emissions, somehow the heat will, it, it will, it, and it'll, it'll basically make things even worse if we reduce our carbon emissions, so we're doomed. So, uh, I mean, I'm probably not saying it correctly, but that's basically the idea. And if those listening and watching want to look it up, his name is Guy McPherson. Um, I, you know, I thought he was coming from a very loving place, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's odd. Anyway, go ahead. And, and you, you remember that we started to say with the Guardian that we can no longer use the expression global warming or climate change because mm -hmm. we are before climate collapse. Uh, and that means something very simple. The climate we had is no longer there. Uh, then we lost it already. Mm -hmm. And what we have, uh, the new climate is something that we really know almost nothing. Uh, we are trying to learn what is it? What is this new climate? All the dates, all the signs for agriculture, etc., no longer valid. Because you know everything is changing, the rain season is changing, all the seasons are changing, the reactions of the plants are changing. We we are before that new climate, in which we we don't know, for example, if that new climate is or not compatible with human life. Uh, we cannot be sure that MacPherson is basically wrong. We, we don't know if we are or not doomed. But what we know for sure is that we, if we continue doing what we have been doing all this time, yes, we are doomed. And then we will be accomplices of that, uh, of that situation. That the only way um, to survive is to stop doing what we have been doing. No, let's go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it's a, yeah, 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 that's it. What I want to go back to is because I feel this is so critical because one of the things that I talk about a lot in this podcast is, and I talk with most of my guests about this, how did you make a, a choice towards creativity and love versus destructiveness and, and selfishness? And I, I, and I think about that within myself each day, because, you know, here I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to, you know, find my voice and find my path in this world and how I fit into it. And I'm going through uh, losing my eyesight and hearing, and there's a lot of pain and anger associated with it. And I think about how, how upset I get every day or, or depressed or whatever. And, and I can see myself, there's some kind of uh, something within me. And I think it's in, within all human beings. Um, is, is when we're in pain, we want to externalize that because I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, projecting anger creates a sense of power uh, or, you know, uh, uh, conflicting our anger on others creates a sense of, uh, of strength, a false sense of strength, I should say. And my question is, how do we rewire ourselves so that we're coming from a loving, empathetic place? In, and one thing that really makes sense to me, and I was listening to Mark Maron's podcast with uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, and one of the things he was talking about is we we need to stop reducing our relationships to transactions. He says, and he was saying that um, you know transactions in relationships diminish our our, our humanity, and. So I, I kind of want to go from that. How do we get to that root cause uh, uh, this, the, the, that's in our mind where we, where we begin to formulate these thoughts of how to act? 
And of course, uh, one one way um, is reclaiming the experience of, of love. When uh, you are making love, it's not a transaction. I will give you this amount of pressure and then you will give me this amount of pressure. That, that, that will spoil <laughs> the, whole, <laughs> the whole relation. How in love you are not having uh, you are not expecting reciprocity and you are not having a transaction. You are not, uh, the, the pressure is in giving. The real pressure, the maximum pressure is to give, not to get. Not to get any change for what you give. But that, let, let me say something that in my experience is even more difficult. When I say, that we don't need anyone governing us. The immediate reaction is not only calling, not only calling me anarchist, that is wrong, I am not an anarchist. It is basically saying that is impossible, you will create chaos. And we can see that we're living in a chaos, that, that order, and, and, and we are living in a moment of increasing authoritarianism all over the world, we, we have more, more and more and more authoritarianism and a very peculiar authoritarianism because it's an authoritarianism without authority and applying uh, forces because they cannot uh, really uh, get the pertinent reaction. But anyway, the point is ask every person, ask time and again, what is the possibility of living without someone governing us. What is to live without an order in which someone has the authority to tell you what to do or not to do? And that can be in very simple way. Say instead of the classroom, that is a very despotic system, let's try to imagine a place to learn when there is no teacher when it's the people learning together and when there is no, no authority telling you what is what you must learn, when you choose what you want to learn by yourself. And I should bring up that you and I met at the SIT Graduate Institute, which no longer exists because it collapsed, yes. uh, I think was a, a precursor to what's happening globally. <laughs> Yes. But, but it collapsed, and um, and I, I when and what you were teaching at when you came and visited was social justice education, and when you entered the room, you didn't say anything, and all of us students, all of us were looking around like, what's going on, and you basically asked us to learn from each other. And some people were really upset. They're like, I paid, you know, fifty thousand dollars to fucking come here, and I'm uh, we're supposed to learn from each other. I'm, I, you know, some but that person was like, I want, I want to be downloaded with information. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't want to uh, learn from each other. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I thought that was for me, that was a really beautiful experience because it not only disrupted the norm of the classroom environment of the hierarchical uh, teacher disseminating information, but it, it made everybody kind of think like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Like, why, why, why isn't this happening? Why, why can't we have this discussion? And, 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 uh, and I thought, I thought it was really beautiful. And I think that's how we connected was through that. And um, it was the beginning of our friendship. Exactly. And yeah. And that is, this is a very important point. Please think for a moment in the curriculum, that, that the curriculum is that piece. What if instead of a curriculum, that is someone, a bureaucrat someplace, someone in any place decided what is what you must learn? Why instead of that, it is you who decide what is what you want to learn and you decide what is what you want to learn and how will you learn that? And then you will discover that you don't need, of course, if you want to learn something 
that is, you know that this guy knows very well that kind of things, of course you can go and ask that guy, please teach me how to do that, any kind of thing. But it is you that are taking the decision. You are constructing the curriculum. You are defining what is what you want to learn. And this is just one example of what we need to do in every aspect of our life. Um, I am uh, one way of, of doing this, and this is now pretty, uh, there are many people involved in this, uh, Brian. We are abandoning the use of nouns that create dependency and to reclaim the use of verbs. Then instead of education that immediately creates, if I say I need education, I need an educator. I need someone educating me, my, my father, my uh, girlfriend, whoever that is educating me, providing me that specific service of education. If I say learning instead of education, I reclaim my agency. I am the one learning. No one is learning for me. Then I am learning and then I need to create the conditions to learn in freedom and to learn whatever I want to learn. If I say instead of health and then full dependency of the health system that we know how sickening it is, how debilitated, how, how uh, fragile it is today, how the medical profession has taken possession of all the cheap powers to govern our lives, instead of full dependency of that horrible system that we know the corruption of the system, the pharmaceutical industry, etc., etc., we say healing, then I am reclaiming the possibility of healing. And then, of course, I can go and talk with a healer, and I can talk with many different play, play friends and family, etc., to to heal if I need a little help of my friends to heal. But I am healing, and that can be applied to everything. And of course, we have been discussing several times the question of eating. We need to reclaim our way of eating instead of consuming food. Doctor. How, I, I mean, the reason I'm asking this is because, uh, you know, let's go back to Foucault, ridding, ridding the mind of the fascist within or getting rid of those destructive uh, thoughts that um, uphold the system that oppresses us and exploits us. Um, I, I want, I, I feel like there has to be some type of practice or a way of, of, of thinking or I, I mean, I, I don't want to be too nebulous, but I'm, what I'm trying to get at is how do we change our thinking? How do we, because even me, you know, I, I, I had this realization yesterday. I, I, because I've been doing, I've done, this will be the 35th interview I've done, right? And I've been doing a lot of interviews. And so I went back and I looked at my website and I was reading the about section <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't even remember this anymore. Like, I don't, what do, I, I, I'm trying to think like, you know, I'm so fucking exhausted from working a nine to five because I have to, because I have to, I have a family to support. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I don't know what, what I'm doing anymore. Like, like I, I don't feel like I'm creating change. I want to. Um, I feel like the main issue is is finding the mental capacity and energy to think creatively in order to enact that change. And that's my problem. I can tell you that right now, like I'll give you an example. I had a few days off. Uh, I don't know. I've had a few days off over the last few years here and there. Right. And then by the end of the, like, let's say the third day off, I start feeling normal. I start feeling like my humor comes back. I feel creative again. I can start thinking. And like yesterday, I had a day completely just to relax and to regroup. And I started having all these realizations and, and started to th thinking creative again. But the problem is that th the system that we're in is designed to keep us so fucking exhausted, worn out, and seeking, uh, you know, transitory pleasures, escapism, 
and and uh, whatever it may be. And and we can't get. And that was one of the things George Carlin said that I fucking loved. He said, you know, this the system is designed so that we can't sit around the dinner table and talk about the people fucking us over. And, and find a solution to it. It's designed so it, we're separated from each other so that we can't organize and get together and, 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 and create social change. So my question is, how do we change our thinking? And uh, perhaps, uh, Brian, um, our next, we will be forced to have another conversation. This is not the last, I am sorry. Mm -hmm. the, perhaps the next conversation is how we all really create the difference immediately. Because what you describe is the situation of the majority of people on earth that are have, have been forced to work um, from nine to five or, or more. Uh, now they are working more than eight hours a day, more than 40 hours a week, just to keep uh, the job. You, you know that this is the normal situation. Many people, those that are lucky enough to have a job need to work more than what is um, in the contract just to keep, uh, to keep the job. And the, and the owners know this yes, and, yes. and, and they take advantage of it and they yes. like, oh, well, there's always somebody else willing to take your position. Exactly. Exactly. That yeah. is, that is, a, that is. Everyone a is expendable. Yes. Well, now um, I, I had the privilege that I resigned uh, from the last job I had was in 1976, Brian. I, 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 am, I have been able to uh, live without a job, without the burden of, of a job. Even if I have been forced to look for my sustenance, Yes, without accepting a job, without accepting that kind of things. My, my life uh, from nine to five uh, trapped in one place with one boss, et cetera, et cetera. Then that is what we need to do. Because let me say this, uh, Brian, this is a question of survival because millions of people are losing their jobs. I will not get their jobs back, never. Even if Mr. Maiden gets the approval of his infrastructure program and you have lots of, uh, of work in the roads in, in, uh, in the US and many jobs have, are created, most people that lost their jobs will not get their jobs back. The era of job is over. And that means that people to survive, now they are forced to find how to live without a job. That is a very, very important point. That is a central point. How we can create life, our own life, without jobs. How we can break that dependency. In that sense, coming back to our conversation, we can see also the jobs as consumption. In the same way that we are consuming products, we are consuming jobs. We are fully dependent of a job to survive for the sustenance of your family. You need your job. How to escape from that condition? How? And I, and I have no fucking idea how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> like even myself and I and I know what we're talking about because we're talking about food sovereignty and healing and uh, and so on but I still you know uh, don't know how to to do that to some degree because of the restriction of 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 still having to survive within the system yeah uh, in, this is of course without fundamentalism uh, we are still, we are living, we, we are not uh, um, traveling to Mars. <laughs> we, we are living in this planet. We need to accept some rules of the system. Um, it, just to the simple things, yes, I can abandon the idea of the automobile and use my legs. But if I am walking, I need to respect the traffic lights to cross the street. <laughs> because mm -hmm. if not, if I am not respecting those rules, a car will cross over me. Uh, 
that is uh, that we live in that system. We need to accept some rules of the system. We cannot escape from those rules from one day to the next. Uh, I can remember very well my friend Lee Benson that for 50 years, he was able to live without paying taxes in San Francisco. Uh, that was an incredible amount of work for him to avoid paying taxes. Uh, but I am assuming just for those listening and watching, it wasn't just to avoid taxes like a lot of people want to do. It was a it was a political statement, I'm assuming, because exactly. like I, I know somebody who wanted to pr protest military spending. So the person did not pay taxes because he did not want his money going to uh, right. to war. Yeah, that was yeah. a political statement. That was he. He is an he was an anarchist, and he dedicated a, a very important effort to avoid paying taxes as an anarchist, refusing uh, to to give part of the life to the state, to the apparatus, etc. But yes, that is a political. But but we need to live. That required a lot of effort. It was not uh, simple. It's not simple to do that. It's not uh, simple to broke those fundamental rules uh, imposed by the system. And then we, yes, we we cannot um, abandon the the planet. We, we need we, it, the idea. Well, what we are talking is not to to transform yourself in an hermit in in the um, and and find refuge in the forest. And to live separated from the rest of the world for the rest of your life. No, no, no. We are talking about living a healthy, good life uh, in these conditions, and that means not being fundamentalist. There are still some things that you need to to obey, you know, that you need to accept in this system. But basically, protecting most of your life in freedom to create an opportunity to live in freedom without the system. And of course, to say it is very simple. Uh, for example, to produce your own food. Uh, we have been discussing that all the time. Uh, that is not so simple, but it is not so difficult. And more and more people in the US and every place on earth are trying to um, succeed in controlling what they are eating instead of the toxic food offered by the market, they are producing their own food at home or having arrangements with friends in rural areas. You have in your area, these kind of things in operation. And some of them are failing, some of them are having are in trouble, but many of them are succeeding all over the way, the planet. That is, uh, it is easy to say, but it's not so easy to do. Let's talk about that in our next conversation, right? Yes, and I really want to get to how how do we make that internal change of thinking? That's that's so important because I think that's where it all begins. That's the root the root of it all is changing that internal thought process so that we can then act from that loving, compassionate, and yeah. empathetic place. The um, point is very simple: uh, posing yourself the honest question and trying to answer it even against your deep convictions. If you say how we can live without someone governing us, and then apply this to your family, how you abandon the idea of uh, being the boss for the children. Can the children uh, have no bosses? Can we think in a family in which the parents are not the bosses of the children? Can we have, how can we live a happy life in a family without hierarchy, without someone governing the lives of the others? Uh, what is that? How you can experience that in the family and then try to imagine in the rest of your life. You will not be able to change that in your work, I am sure. It will be very difficult to negotiate with your boss that uh, you will have no longer a boss. Uh, <laughs> you will not accept the boss, then you will be fired. <laughs> um, perhaps that will be uh, useless to try to change things in your uh, um, in, in the place where you are getting uh, your job. 
but begin in the rest of your life, in the other spaces, for example, in the family, and try to see how to live without someone governing, uh, without someone in charge with the authority and the rules and the capacity to force you to do what you don't want to do. I, I know you have to go, but just in saying that, you know, I'm thinking about that is that that fascist thinking, that 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 kind of authoritarian thinking is ingrained within us uh, as I mean, as Americans, it, it's in our DNA. It's there because that's how this country was formed. <laughs> is is through that uh you know oppressive uh violent um you know uh, imposing of ideologies on others um and so how do we get that out of our our mind so yes, we'll, we'll talk about that next time but yeah yes and but it is really so unnatural that you need to be educated and again and again every generation mm -hmm. and the school is clearly organized for that purpose to, to produce that absolutely, to reformulate the DNA for everyone to accept an authoritarian system. The school is that place to create in every person, in every American, the conviction that that is the way things are. Well, thank you so much. Before you, we depart, um, I, I want to say something. This is my wife's birthday, Rachel's birthday today. Oh, please give give her a great hug in my name. I will. I will. It's uh, yeah. I I'm so grateful to have met her and and to be able to celebrate her life. And I I actually said so, I I you know I'm not just celebrating her. I'm worshiping her because uh, I'm so grateful for the love and the, the gifts that she has uh, brought to me. So. And I know you know her, and 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 I'm I'm grateful that, that we had an opportunity before COVID happened to meet. Yes, yeah. I, I adore her, and hopefully we will meet again soon. Yes, thank you. Well, um, oh, by the way, is your website up and running? GustavoEsteva.com is that still? Not yet. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, you, everybody uh, who's listening, you can find Gustavo. He's, there's many videos of him on YouTube. Um, and I think you're on quite a few podcasts as well, if I remember yeah. looking. So if you look through Apple Podcasts and Spotify, uh, you can find uh, different interviews as well. So he also has uh, books as well, Escaping Education um, and grassroots yes. postmodernism, correct? Yes, yes, yes. It's still, so, it's still, uh, around. Excellent. So this was the Blind Men in Black. I'm your host, Brian Snyder. Uh, please like and subscribe. It really helps. You can find me in, uh, on uh, blindmenandblack.com. Thank you so much, Gustavo. I'm looking forward to our next discussion. Please stay healthy and safe. And now we are going to have our awkward ending. Yes, una, un abrazo, Brian. Thank Abrazos. you for inviting me for this conversation. Thank you. It was, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.